Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. We're uh, ready for our third and final session of the day. Um, our presenter to begin here will be uh, Ragnar Mistke Bergam, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Norwegian School of Theology, Religion, and Society. So he's currently working on a project focusing on the place um, and meaning of representation and political life analyzed from a theological perspective. Um, he's already written a book on political theology as well as an important article focusing on uh, theological genealogy. So his, his paper for today um, continues that sort of fruitful line of thinking. Um, his paper title, which I'm just pulling up here, uh, his paper title is The Spirit of Modernity and Its Fate. So uh, with that, uh, over to you, Ragnar. Thank you, Darren. Um, I, I've chosen the, the approach of sort of uh, creating a short, a shorter version of my paper, which I will read. So it summarizes the, the main parts, I think. Um, so my uh, hope with this paper was to, to get uh, a sort of vantage on, on uh, a way of writing genealogy by developing uh, a figure of uh, modernity as a kind of faith. Um, and I'm, I'm, I try to uh, begin the paper by treating it as a theme that the modern theologies since the 18th century have responded to in various ways. Now I should stress that this is a heuristic scheme, though it, it does have traction <laughs> with reality, uh, but it does not it do anything like justice to all of the complexities we are talking about here. Uh, by developing the, this uh, theme in modern theology, I, I, I seek to understand what sort of the, the more recent turn to genealogical writing, and by recent, I say basically past 40 years or something like that, uh, what, what the intention of that, that turn was. Now, so uh, to present the, the figure of modernity as a kind of fate, uh, on the one hand, there is the idea that modernity is our fate in the sense that it in, is an inescapable condition for better than, or worse. And I think this is quite, uh, quite uh, commonly known and, and a, quite a common theme in genealogies of modernity, the sense that modernity is our fate and that as a problem. On the other hand, modernity has often been understood as itself suffering a fate. The teleological structure of the progressivist narratives of modernity is almost symmetrically repeated in narratives of decline, according to which the internal logic of progression surpasses every contingent obstacle and driving it to its destined end. And with the story of modernity, theology was seemingly faced with a gift it could not refuse. There was a sense that modernity constituted a break with the Christian idea, or perhaps that modernity was the simultaneous realization and exhaustion of Christianity, itself overcoming in and as the modern secular world. In either way, theology threatened to become irrelevant or reactionary, or bo often both. Therefore, theologians faced a dilemma Either one must accept that modernity is detrimental to Christianity and catastrophic for theology, or one must claim the gift as one's own, as precisely the unfolding of the very revelation of God. So that's sort of the just so story of modernity as faith. Now, with the rise of especially postmodern critiques of modernity, uh, some theologians regained new confidence and began to employ the genealogical method in a particular way. And here I think of the genealogical method as a specific form of critique that gains its own sort of prominence, especially after Foucault, though with clear lines back to Nietzsche, as we already learned. According to Foucault, genealogical writing is, not, is a work on the self that aims at recovering possibilities of thinking and being. And what is noticeable with Foucault's account of genealogy is that although he doesn't renounce his modern attitude or his modernity, but he still refuses the blackmail of enlightenment or modernity as if they were a face. At the same time, he also uh, rejects all liberating projects that claim to be, and I quote, global or radical. <laughs> 
so in one sense, he, he's, uh, he's uh, not rejecting modernity in total, but he also, uh, and he also presents a genealogical method that can help us with, with understanding modernity, but he also rejects those uh, projects that claim to be global or radical. Nonetheless, from the 1980s onwards, theological genealogists appropriated the method for a radical goal, a liberation from the fate of modernity obtained by historicizing the conditions that had hitherto seemed unavoidable. Gene genealogists assisted theologians in suspending the, the necessity of modernity by rejecting the idea that it is an inescapable condition to which theological imagination must submit. And I focused on sort of one a prominent group of, of thinkers here. And, and uh, here I'm especially thinking of the sort of Anglo Catholic theology centered around Cambridge and Nottingham, but not exclusively so. So I'm thinking of genealogies written by thinkers such as John Heraton's Conference, Connor Cunningham, Adrian Pabst, or other North American thinkers like Michael Gillespie they tend to locate the contingent rise of modernity primarily in highly subtle shifts in theological positions in high and late medieval thoughts. And the aim is most often to circumscribe the central historical characteristics of modernity and thereby to open up the possibility for a challenge and revive a stifled imagination and encumbered by the sway of modernity. I think it is fair to say that such genealogies have revealed that familiar stories about our present conditions are just that, stories that may be contested or modified. But they often gone beyond Foucault's more modest sense of genealogy. One gains at times the sense that the liberation has only occurred in the realm of ideas, that it is only virtual, so that the count of modernity, that sort of pit against the, the large uh, secular modernity is, uh, more or less a shadow. But that's precisely because the, the genealogical project is global. More importantly, I worry that the figure of uh, the fate of modernity continues to operate in the background of many theological genealogies. First, theological genealogists seek to outnarrate modernity because they're persuaded that its arc bends towards disruption. Time and again, modernity is denounced as fragmented, socially unsustainable, or intellectually unsatisfying. The essential nature of modernity overrides other historical contingencies and drives it towards a collapse of its own making. Second, some theological genealogies confirm the very fate they sought to dispel, namely, the the, uh, namely that the fate of modernity is our fate. Now, while such gene genealogies take a principled stand against dialectical progression, they inadvertently tend to reinsert another kind of dialectic, dialectic into history. When the genealogy is taken as real history, when one sort of identifies this myth with history as such, history soon splits into two, either chronologically or synchronologically. Now, while some genealogists qualified the relationship between the Christian of the story and the story of secular modernity. I'm nonetheless concerned that one only admits borderline cases after one has established the epochal categories. Thus, one can paradoxically grant too much to op optimistic narrations of modernity. Only when one first has granted that modernity is almost total, like almost defining of all of our existence, does one initiate a radical or global genealogical project that, that, that then seek to circumscribe what one previously had thought was unavoidable. Now, this leads to certain problems, I believe. Now, symptom of, of, of this is the awkwardness sometimes of the alternative that theological genealogies seek to present. Graham Ward once made a comment about Charles Taylor's A Secular Age. Something strange occurs at that point in the book when Taylor is finished with the story of the rise of our secular condition, and he suddenly shifts gears and speaks as a Catholic philosopher. The latter part of the book involves a shift in perspective that Ward claims should have been reflected earlier in the book. 
Ward was probably thinking that Taylor's genealogy is still, uh, still retains some questionable secularist assumptions. But I think the broader point is that something strange is taking place in the transition from description to prescription. The problem appears in the interim between the, uh, between the narration of the mas mastodon called secular modernity and what, whatever other story we choose to tell in its wake or uh, in its place. Having ceded most of the ground to modernity, one's alternative could not but look like a nearly virtual affair, at best an interesting idea to be located at certain niche moments in the history of theology or philosophy. Now the issue here is not, I think, primarily the work of prescription, but rather that of description. Although some genealogists might claim that these categories associated with the modern are insufficient for describing how we have been living and thinking for the past centuries, very little of that descriptive work is done. Thus, I believe that we need to attend to new mood, modes of description that provide different perspectives on the institutions and practices customarily associated with modernity. Merely as an example, I find helpful uh, that Graham Ward, once again, has pointed to the Marina Bay Sands Hotel in Singapore, a high rise building shaped like a ship sailing through the night sky, hovering over the Indian Ocean, one of the crossed out gods of our time, to use uh, Latour's words. Such accounts, uh, could be employed, of course, to argue that modernity is deluded about its inability to uh, deluded about its ability to describe its institutions. But I think that's somewhat beside the point. If one thinks such forms of description are helpful because they allow us to say that ultimately Augustine or Thomas was right, I, I fear that one is not taking the work of description very seriously. Furthermore. This work of description cannot be singularly oriented to pointing to those moments or ideas most porous to divine, to divine truth, which I think, not is, uh, think is not exhaustive of the theological task anyways. The Marina uh, Bay Sands Hotel is undoubtedly a beacon of transcendence in a most modern city, but does it mean that the hotel is a reflection of something previously lost in modernity? Or perhaps it is a work of idolatry, idolatry, a parody of the true worship of the triune God. I suspect that such hasty interpretations sometimes are mere reflexes, symptoms of an impatient theology reaching for a last word on the matter. Now, uh, uh, as is typical, it's easier to critique than to sort of provide an alternative. And I cannot adequately unpack how a different mode of description can or should be done, though I have said a little bit about it in a previous article. But still, I just want to gesture toward two other kinds of suspensions, I call it, that are frequently lost in theological genealogies and that I believe would help us with that work of description. These are not modes of release from a particular history or fate, but rather a, ways, uh, a way of holding history for a moment so as to consider what tends to be lost in genealogical narration. The first suspension is that of the present. I believe that although genealogies are very clearly born in a polemical context, they too quickly take leave of those uh, contexts. On the general level of theological method, I want to note that genealogists instigate hier hierarchies by producing valuations of history, which is not as such problematic. However, they should acknowledge how these evaluations arise as of an attempt to discern the present and consequently also their inherent limitations. Stories are often, not only, but often born out of conflicts and wounds and they may shed light on the present Yet they may also distort our understanding of history and ourselves when we, read, when we treat them as obviously true accounts of the past. To admit as much is not to reduce genealogies to mere reflections of the contemporary historical conditions, but rather a point about theological language. Insofar as we are operating in a theological mode, then theological description must erect hierarchies, but it must also be able to su suspend its own instigated hierarchies. 
without suspending the present and considering the limited, sometimes comical and clearly deficient context of production, genealogies are at a risk of claiming to themselves a divine perspective on history. The second uh, suspension is that of the past. Uh, theological attention to the past should be careful with dividing history into two. Instead, I believe that the pneumatological and Christological license of theological attention allows us to seek insight within the past moment, which would balance the temptation of genealogies to seek liberation from history. By suspending the past moment, freezing it for a while, one may find that one is on the way towards participating in its spirit, a spirit that is always conflicted and fragmented, yet that could reveal something to be retrieved. Such an approach should, I believe, go beyond pointing to right and wrong opinions and instead pay attention to the tensions, conflicts and resolutions within the past moments and actors and how these dynamics may resonate with questions and conflicts of our own. Now, before getting to sort of my concluding section, I just want to make an essential qualification here. I'm, I'm sort of shooting with big guns, and, and uh, this is a, a, a heuristic uh, practice. And I'm not saying uh, that genealogical writing is uh, essentially bad or, or wrong, but I think it has played an important, and I think it has played an important role in countering the feeling that modernity is our fate. But there's a tension here between method and substance and or, or substance and pra practice of the, the method. Um, so I hope that what I'm uh, proposing here is not a straightforward alternative, but only some reflections on what might at this point be done better. So in, in uh, closing this paper, let me briefly turn to two critiques of Western modernity written around a decade ago that focused on race and colonialism if only to give an illustration of the difference that I have just been gesturing towards. In Race, a Theological Account, James Cameron Carter seeks to uncover the theological underpinnings of the racial imagination of Western modernity and argues that it has its origin in Christian supersessionalism. By abstracting Christ from the Jewish flesh of Jesus, it constructs a racial hierarchy in which the figure of the Jew begins to stand for the East and Christ for the Occidental. In response, Carter pits a different theological imagination against the pseudo-theological imagination of modernity. He, arrived, he revised the Afro-Christian imagination of Britton Hammond, Frederick Douglass, and Jorian Lee, and enlists a trio of church fathers, Irenaeus, Nyssa, and Maximus. Now, Carter employs a familiar genealogical tactic. First, he presents modernity as our fate. Then he presents a genealogical suspension of that fate. And uh, finally, he presents another imagination, another story. I think his work is called for, and it's uh, quite frankly dazzling at times, but I, wor I worry that it repeats some of that uh, genealogical desire to get on top of things and get a divine perspective on history. By contrast, uh, Willie James Jennings takes a somewhat different approach in uh, the Christian imagination, theology, and the origins of race. Jennings is as interested in racial and colonial origins as Carter is, but instead of engaging in genealogical suspension, he dwells with certain moments in the history of colonialism. And I quote, rather than telling the story of a devastating flood, he focuses on the person trapped on the roof with no place to go. His intention is not only to understand the origin of colonialism in the medieval Christian imagination, but to suspend the past, to look for other possibilities that can only be discovered by paying careful attention to the particular moment. In Jennings' own words, theology can reveal the redemptive elements buried inside a colonial operation elements that truly can open up possibilities of a new world beyond the tragedy of the remade one. For him, the aim is not to dispel the fate of modernity, but to uncover redemptive possibilities of learning something within our broken history that we have forgotten or have not yet learned. This approach does not divide history into two or present modernity as a fate. Instead, it looks for Christ within the historical moment in order to discover how 
even in the worst aspect of history that are sedimented in our present, there were and are possibilities for finding truth, not necessarily in the right actors of, or ideas, but just as often in the wrong ones. Now, these are redemptive possibilities that were perhaps missed at the time. Nevertheless, because the spirit is always calling for us and because history lives with us, they may be discovered pre precisely now. Thank you very much, Ragnar, for that uh, rich paper. Um, the response to your paper will come from Jonathan Teubner, um, who is a research fellow in religion and theology at Australian Catholic University. So he's one of my colleagues at ACU. Um, he is also an Alexander von Humboldt research fellow um, at the Humboldt uh, University in Berlin. He's written a recent book on Augustine and his reception in the medieval period, and he's now working on um, a study of Adolf von Hardak. Um, so we'll look forward to hearing what uh, Jonathan makes of Ragnar's proposal about uh, genealogies. Thank you, Darren. Um, thank you, um, Ragnar, particularly for that nice summary you provided of the paper. Um, it's quite impressive to get your paper into that in such a way. Um, I appreciate that you were kind of qualifying some things that um, weren't qualified in the paper. What this is, is as you know, I was responding to your paper. So forgive me, um, but definitely call me to account when I'm not recognizing, I think particularly the way that you were gesturing towards it being a heuristic, which is not something I saw in your paper. But um, I, I recognize there are gonna be some differences. So without further ado, I'll just read the text here and then we'll take it from there. Ragnar has provided us with what is possibly the most on-point contribution to the symposium I have had the opportunity to read. But this is no surprise really. Ragnar got there before many of us, or at least me, with his article on the persistence of the genealogical and modern theology. In his paper for this gathering, Ragnar offers a compelling account of modern theology's continual captivity to modernity as fate. That is, as he said, modernity is an escapable condition for better or worse. But at the same time, Ragnar thinks that modernity is often understood as itself suffering a fate. He points out that the progressivist narratives of modernity boldly proclaim that we are heading to a new utop utopia or to the end of history filled with the spoils of liberal democratic capitalism, but for all, so we're led to believe. These progressive narratives, Ragnar reminds us, are symmetrically repeated in narratives of decline. Instead of leaping over every foreseeable hurdle, our culture trips over every little twig in its way. These two fates, our fate within modernity and modernity's own fate, provide Ragnar with the essential problem of theological ge genealogies of modernity that need to, needs to be addressed. Ragnar begins this effort by providing an account of Foucault's understanding of genealogy as a work on the self that aims at recovering possibilities of thinking and being into which he reads theological genealogists. The theological genealogists, so Ragnar claims, draw on Foucault's efforts to see the contingencies of a particular moment, to see the ways in which genealogical writing opens the possibility of liberation from our current predicament. Ragnar goes on to imply, however, that these gene theological genealogists forego Foucault's caution that this liberation must not be translated into a total emancipation from history. In fact, Ragnar thinks that theological genealogists make use of Foucault's approaches to show the ways in which modernity is contingent and then take a non-Foucaultian step and say modernity can thereby be suspended. It is in this sense, then, that Ragnar thinks theological genealogists are radicalized versions of Foucault. There are very few theological genealogists Ragnar does not implicate in this radicalism. While there is a page or two that devolves into naming a diverse set of scholars and projects, which suggests Ragnar has his own proposal that he wants to set against all of this, more on this in a moment, I do think it is helpful that he shows that this form of inquiry is not only being done by those we associate with more traditional or conservative theological and political leanings, but also among some progressive, liberation, feminist, post-colonial, and Black theologists. 
Within these efforts, Ragnar detects a kind of swollen confidence and tendency to overreach. And presumably that is not only true for the trads, but also those we associate with more critical schools of thought. I think it is almost certainly true that genealogists come with an extra dose of confidence and that this can sometimes lead them to overpromising, overstating, and alas, underdelivering. But perhaps this is inevitable when we are considering projects that want to talk about this highly internally diverse thing called modernity. I find it intriguing that I have not yet heard anyone give an account of what this thing of modernity is and when it ever happened, but we'll return to this. This collapsing of theological genealogies leads Ragnar into the part of his paper that attempts to move the conversation toward more and better modes of description. Ragnar thinks the genealogists have on the whole granted too much to a certain understanding of modernity. And this creates a kind of awkwardness in the alternatives that theological genealogists seek to present. The case in point, as he mentioned, is Charles Taylor's A Secular Age. And he draws on Graham Ward here to look, see the inside that Taylor's book shifts in tone halfway through. We find Taylor speaking, no longer speaking as a keen observer of modernity, but as a Catholic philosopher. I think, I think this reading is, a, is controversial, but, um, but I take it the point that Ragnar is trying to get to is that something strange is taking place in the trans, transition from description to prescription. And there's really no surprise there because you know, whether it's going to be Lessing's ditch or something else, this is a very you know, difficult problem. But I think the problem that he's trying to say to present to us is when so much ground is given to modernity, what kind of alternative is truly possible? And I think Ragnar here is raising a helpful question and one that I'd like to dwell on for a moment. We should not only ask what the alternative to this mastodon of modernity is, but what form should such an alternative take given all that is claimed about modernity? Ragnar thinks we need more and better modes of description. And here's where Ragnar's paper becomes most interesting, I think. His plea is for new modes of description that provide different perspectives on the institutions and practices customarily associated with modernity. He offers two such examples, one of which he referred to. First, Ragnar reminds us of Graham Ward's Marina Bay Sands Hotel in Singapore that is shaped like a ship sailing through the night and gestures, in Ward's account at least, towards those crossed out gods of our time. And second, he points us to his own interest in the metaphysical underpinnings of contemporary political institutions. He finds a contemporary parliamentary architecture. And honestly, I think this paper would benefit by hearing more about that. Um, and Ward's example is, is, however, merely a foil for Ragnar. He suspects that Ward's example reveals rather weakly that modernity can't properly describe itself. Instead, Ragnar wants to the work of a description to move beyond pointing to those moments of poor, th those moments porous the divine truth, and seems to imply that Ward's effort to see the hotel as a reflection of something previously lost in modernity and with a rightly inspired description can be shown as the persistence of transcendence. It, and this is only part of the task of theology. It's just a side, uh, Ragnar gives no indication why his own example doesn't fall prey to the same criticism here. What Ragnar wants instead to look, wants instead is to look for possibilities not yet realized, which genealogists are, I think, pointing us to already, as Ragnar acknowledges, but also those that are realized but have been overlooked. And here we get to Ragnar's two you know, kind of own proposals of the two suspensions, the suspension of the present and the suspension of the past. In the suspension of the present, Ragnar wants more attention paid to the polemical context in which efforts of description emerge. I agree with him that many theological genealogists do take leave of their own context rather quickly. So this is a salutary point, um, if I think it's actually somewhat uncontroversial. In the second suspension, the suspension of the past, Ragnar wants those struggling to describe, to dwell with the past moments, to see them for all their complication, contradictions, and capacity to expand our understanding today. This is, I think, a rather more interesting proposal. 
But I'm left one wondering whether Radner wants or Ragnar wants anything more than just a compelling historical description. Or does he perhaps want something like an ethnography of resonant events, groups, and places, a mode of inquiry that is increasingly fashionable in theology today? Or, and this is what I hope, is Ragnar struggling towards something that achieves all the things that rich and detailed historical and ethnographic description do, but in such a way that puts it to us, puts us in a position to learn from these stories, that refuses the God's eye view that is often quite quietly smuggled in to even the most participant observation efforts. Our instinct to judge is, I think, part of what it means to be human. And we lose something very important when we resolutely refuse to judge. But I think Ragnar is rightly reminding us that sometimes we need to curb this instinct or at least postpone it for a moment. This is salutary, but difficult for us as it seems that the temptation to judge first and learn later seems greater than ever. I see this playing out in the domain of scholarship with which I am most familiar. It seems all too easy right now to say what is wrong with Augustine with the not so subtle implication that we have nothing to learn from him, which is just the reverse of those who conceive of Augustine as an unchallengeable authority. Ultimately, what I find most attractive of Ragnar's paper is that efforts at description ought to hold open the possibility of learning from history, from each other, from error, and from triumph. In this vein, I think Ragnar's most pressing concern about theological genealogies is not that they are some radicalized Foucauldianism, but they cut off the possibility of learning in time. Let me close here with some remarks in response to Ragnar's conclusion that very interestingly draws into the discussion Carter's and um, Carter and Jennings, as he outlined already. And I think just incidentally, these two theologians would have contributed in their own voice rather nicely to this gathering. Um, but instead they have the two of us to talk about and maybe other people too. For Ragnar, Carter and Jennings represent the difference between a theological genealogy that is trapped in faithfulness and, is a, and what I think is actually being laid out at least in the paper as an alternative that seeks to dwell with certain moments in history. And I entirely agree that Jennings offers us an exciting and compelling account and that we should see it as modeling a way to go about reflecting on how we got to this moment and where we can go from here. However, I think the portrait Ragnar draws of Carter says more about Ragnar's constructive proposal than Carter's book. And I think there's at least one other way to understand Carter's book. Ragnar sees in Carter an effort to uncover the theological underpinnings of the racial imagination of Western modernity, which is for Carter contiguous with Christian supersessionism or Christianity's quest to sever itself from its Jewish roots. Its Christological fallacy consists of abstracting Christ from the Jewish flesh of Jesus and then constructing a racial hierarchy in which the figure of the Jew stands for East and Christ for the West. And in this as Ragnar laid out, Carter is reviving an Afro-Christian imagination and drawing on a set of Christian kind of late antique, Greek late antique figures. Carter's error, so Ragnar implies, is that he baptizes the Christian racial imagination as the constitutive theological dimension of modernity and as the er distortion of true Christian imagination. According to Ragnar, Carter's operation is to present modernity as our fate, that he presents a genealogical relativization of its necessity, and finally he presents us an alternative story. This count, however, is captive to Ragnar's own interpretive scheme, I think, and so ignores the pr pragmatic repair that is operating in Carter's project. Carter is offering a reparative Christology whose sources for repair come from within Carter's own traditions. And narrating one's own traditions is significantly different from narrating others' traditions. This is a point that I fear is all too often obscured by lumping theological genealogies together. But it relates to my concern that we are often dealing with this undifferentiated modernity, leaving it ambiguous, at least, whether it is our tradition that we must own up to or the other tradition that threatens our own. I'm far from being an authority on Carter's work, but I, su 
but I suspect it is being subtly distorted when implicated as yet another example of theological genealogies you know, that are tempted to get on top of things. There is, however, a larger point here. This returns me to the form of the alternative that theological genealogies urge upon us. I hope it is clear that I find Ragnar's proposal compelling, but not, I don't think it's clear that everyone agrees that another mode of description, which is really a redescription here, is what is called for. I think pragmatic reparative theologians offer one such alternative. They don't just want to offer more or better descriptions, but are seeking to repair the very logics and patterns of interpreting scripture, proclaiming the gospel, and forming community. I'm not by any means the best spokesperson for <laughs> pragmatic reparative theology, but it does, I think, offer a way to think about how these narratives of modernity would inspire something more than just another narrative of modernity. One could easily take away from our gathering that we are meant to simply go about telling more and better stories. And I take Cyril's point from last session here that there are going to be times when narrating is apologetically important. But, you know, I think as we all, or some of us have um, voiced, this, this is not gonna be exhaustive of the theological task. So, and here just in final speaking my own voice, if we are really meant to learn from our modes of description or our genealogies, we need to take more seriously what form our learning should take. And, and for this, um, I'm indebted to Ragnar for helping me understand just how important that point is in light of all of this great and wonderful work that we've been discussing. Thank you, Ragnar. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for the response to the paper. Um, those of you in the audience, I invite you again to uh, submit questions in the Q&A feature, and we'll try and get in as many of those as we have time for. Um, so Jonathan has responded to Ragnar. Ragnar, would you like to say a few things back in reply to Jonathan um, as the yeah. panel is beginning to come in and broaden out the discussion? Very much uh, so. And, and thank you, Jonathan, for that. That was, that was wonderful. And uh, uh, I, I apologize if I sort of qualified myself as writing it because I had already started to take into account some of your criticisms, which I think were were uh, correct in the sense that they, they they point to the danger and also in what I'm doing of repeating some of the vices that I'm pointing to, basically. Uh, so um, now uh, let me first just address uh, two short things, and then uh, just uh, let me say a little bit more about about description and so forth. Um, I think I I had. Uh, it, I haven't been clear enough about my point about Graham Ward. I was not actually criticizing his analysis. I was I was just from that uh, uh, taking that as an example. I say that one way of of interpreting the Marina Bay Sands Hotel would be to, and then I I wasn't trying to re repeat what he was saying saying, but I I wasn't clear enough about that. And I get your point about Carter as well, and I think that it 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 demonstrates the danger of being taken captive to one's inter interpretive scheme. Uh, now, when that is said, I, I, am, uh, uh, I am treating my scheme somewhat heuristically, and I was when I was writing it, but it wasn't clearly enough expressed because um, as one writes, one needs big stories. And also when we try to write about the genealogies, as we already talked about, we are writing new genealogies, right? Um, my, uh, my hope is that uh, I, I sort of communicate that as we also de trade in such stories, we should uh, let them orient, but not necessarily constrain ourselves. Right? And we should be careful to be taken captive to them. Now, for what, um, for that part that you call the most attractive, but also in the written paper, the least persuasive, and I agree with you, it's the least developed part of, of the paper. Uh, the, the question of the modes of description. Um, how can we find an alternative way of describing and so of learning from history? Uh, one that's not, um, not simply uh, helpful for theology, but also somehow integral to the theological task. Uh, now, while I can see how my paper can be read in this way, I wasn't trying to set up a clearly defined alternative. 
I wasn't trying to sort of divide history again, but I was gesturing in one direction, uh, which wouldn't necessarily take us uh, too far away from the genealogical, but, and I also can see that there are other directions we could go. Now, was I just calling for more historical analysis? Um, yeah, certainly, sure. <laughs> I, I was calling for more historical analysis, but that's not the only point. Uh, it does not suffice to say that we just need to get back to the particular and develop the universal from there. It, uh, so uh, Peter Harrison said uh, the first day that he, he he sort of rather enjoyed working from the particular to the universal, and that's uh, that's worthwhile as a historian. And some theologians ought to do that more, but that's still just operating within uh, the merely historical, if one can speak of that. Now, the point is, I guess that. Um, what I find most helpful about genealogies is precisely that they release some of the constraints from theological modes of description and therefore impels us to, to theologically engage with, with histories, times and places where one previously thought that theological language had no traction. And in saying that it has traction, that doesn't mean, I, that doesn't mean just as descriptive terms. So where I would go beyond the merely historical is that uh, I think a theological engagement with history necessarily operates with several uh, levels of identification between a subject and object. And if we are still going to operate within the confines of the history of Christianity and the histories of, of the church, I think theological narration is also self-narration and self-identification, a process which is both descriptive but also prescriptive because it's always already speaking in norms of who we are, uh, not just descriptively, but who we ought to be. Now, to dwell with the past moment, to suspend it, uh, is not only to sort of partake in a general historical spirit, I would hope, but to think of the object in question or the individuals in question one is engaging with as somehow a fellow traveler as lives that can be explicitly or implicitly um, that can explicitly or can, um, implicitly comment both on on Christ and on me as a member of the body of Christ. Um, thus um, theological narration of history can almost be like uh, triple or quadruple even, because it, it, it can speak of Christ, but also is by speaking of the world. But in speaking of Christ, it's already uh, speaking of the church and therefore also of oneself. Um, so I, I should say that although I, I said that I see a problem with the mode of description in theological genealogies, I'm not saying that we only need a uh, 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 need new modes of description in our theological task. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not trying to exclude the perspective here. Okay, so let, let's uh, stop there. Um, okay, thank you for that um, initial response to Jonathan. Um, our other panelists are with us now and may have questions or comments of their own. Um, I've also got some questions from the floor that I will uh, work in um, at some point. Ashley, can I, can I ask a, pa a panelist a question? <laughs> uh, I, think we'll, I, think, I think we'll allow it. Yeah. So as I was listening to Joel's uh, wonderful paper today, I, I was, I was uh, sort of reminded that somewhere back there in my mind, probably Kierkegaard was sort of, uh, was alive when I was writing about sort of suspending the present and using the word of suspension. And, uh, and this was actually a question I didn't get to ask you, but uh, I mean, it, with Kierkegaard, you have the problem of speaking the third, right? It's all, the third is always sort of the most difficult to say, right? And you sort of almost ironically ended with no time to, <laughs> to speak of the third. Uh, but that gets me back to, to, to what I'm trying to say in this paper. Um, from Kierkegaard's perspective, as moving beyond the one and the other, well, N Nietzsche and Aristotle, as, as you put them up, um, 
that's a uh, sort of dialectical mo movement and, and dialectics always depends on what preceded it, right? So, uh, so uh, can, uh, from Kierkegaard's sense, can we think of the third as still writing the history, for example, still doing genealogy, but doing with a sort of mask and that mask not necessarily being taken in a nihilistic way, right? So, uh, and, and I, I like to sometimes think of the stories I'm writing as, as somehow masks, masks, not in order to, to deceive, but in order precisely to admit the folly of what we are doing here. I wonder if you, I can sort of draw you into this reflection. Uh, you're, you're, you don't have the audio on. Yeah, I find that very, very interesting, Ragnar, especially in view of some readers of Kierkegaard who, um, if, if, if an interpreter sort of appeals to the journals or notebooks or one of the um, veronimous texts, the signed texts that are not pseudonymous, that is, as the real Kierkegaard, others will say, and maybe in a kind of genealogical mode or a Foucauldian mode, um, oh, but that's, that's just SK, that's still another mask. And we never know. And I think Kierkegaard himself probably thought this is something we should all think about for ourselves. He, he did think of his entire authorship or, or SK if we want to have that more deconstructive reading. Um, and, and the text itself um, speaks of the writing process as his um, being educated by providence or students governance his own education. So he doesn't think he has a whole program in advance that he's going to then run in a controlled fashion um, and get on top of it to use your language and get on top of history by narrating it. That world historical project of narrating history is precisely what he's, what he's asking us to st um, stand back and criticize. Nonetheless, these are the lives we live and in hope he can hope that he is being educated in and through these various masks that he's trying on. And that maybe we, all, we too are trying on with our um, hypothetical um, or heuristic stories that we tell. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if we're very conscientious and confess that that's what we're doing, then I think it, it indeed, um, uh, to use uh, Jonathan's term, that, that, that can be still salutary. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I think well, maybe with Bonhoeffer, you know, Bonhoeffer sort of writes a prayer meditation in, in, in prison. So, so even though he didn't know it quite yet, very late in his life. Um, and he's, and who, who am I? Who am mm. I, oh God? Mm. And uh, he doesn't, he can't answer that definitively. He can only try on um, experiments in living. And but but in the confessional, in the in the Christian, not penitential, but just confessing faith mode, say, you know, oh God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I guess what I mean, one thing I've noticed about theological genealogies is that to the extent that they and excuse to tell me if, if, if they baptize sort of Nietzsche, Nietzschean genealogy, if they somehow do that, then the one thing they don't take on from Nietzsche is almost never the irony, right? There's almost never uh, any irony in theological genealogies. They are like, yes. so, <laughs> so completely serious, right? Very so somber. An aspiratory project, yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess that, that's something, yeah, that was part of what I was sort of approaching with talking about suspending the, the present. Yeah. Did I make a point? <laughs> uh, well, actually two points. I want to make sort of a comment uh, about Foucault, mm -hmm. and then I want to make a comment about what I think you're asking for is a regulation with regard to, at least regulation, with regards sort of to uh, Christian genealogy. So the first point has got to do with Foucault. Mm -hmm. Foucault is interesting in a number of respects. You point out one respect, that is a distinction between what Foucault sort of uh, is going to permit in terms of we've got emancipatory potential, but we actually can't operate it. It cannot become operational as far as he's concerned because uh, his genealogy is so Nietzscheanly foundationalist that everything will be about power and power, is, power will only change sort of his particular mm -hmm. clothes, et cetera. So he is the promissory note and then he is the primary inhibitor with respect to emancipation. That notwithstanding, of course, 
metaphorically, he does provide sort of you know, wonderfully thick descriptions um, that sort of we would, if we were Christians, like sort of you know, our genealogists provide sort of similarly thick descriptions of the kind of descriptions that he provides. And of course, those thick descriptions have made their way sort of you know, into the Religious Studies Guild and the Theology Guild, often sort of through early Christian studies, sort of because of other works, the later works of Foucault. So in other words, emancipation is going on, but also has been institutionalized academically. Uh, and at the same time, as it's institutionalized, the overall genealogy is foundationalist and is incredibly corrosive with respect to Christianity, because mm -hmm. it's not going to make the claim that, well, everything about, Christi everything about Christianity, among other things, is about power. It's going to say everything about Christianity is precisely only about power. So that's the first comment I want to make. Mm -hmm. The second comment I think sort of has got to do sort of with you providing rules and regulations with respect sort of to uh, genealogy. So I, I won't take you to major points. I kind of transfer them sort of into another idiom. One thing I took you to be saying, and I agree, that Christian genealogies sometimes misinterpret themselves as they're offering explanation. Then the question would be, if they're going to offer explanation, what's the degree of thick description that we'd have to provide in order for explanation to occur? Now, it's not even clear to me that Foucault, in his not quite microanalysis, his macro microanalysis of institution, would actually think that what he's provided sort of, you know, is you know, the actual picture, other than he's going to uh, suggest that sort of we can say that these things are about power and so forth in some particular way. I'm always reminded of Jean-Paul Sartre. I mean, I read him very early on in my life and uh, much of which I let, let aside, but I do remember his four volume work on Flaubert, uh, at the end of which, which he, the, the intention was to provide an explanation of Flaubert's life, just one person. And then of course, uh, he ends it by suggesting that, or he actually prefaces it uh, with a methodological text saying, no such explanation has been provided. And that's over 2,000 pages. I think so that, it, it, I think what you're doing sort of is very interesting and, and I think important for Christians who engage in this enterprise, including myself. That even if you put in parenthesis the point that Jonathan made, that there's other kinds of things that one might deal with, in addition to thick description, Jonathan would add to thick description a much thicker description than is often provided, that we allow the description itself to have a hold in order sort of for it to be a challenge to us. In other words, it's a kind of hermeneutic. We're not going to, our judgments are going to be better if we allow the evidence to assert this particular weight or weights and then for us to make judgments and so forth. Now, I think actually that alone, I mean, there are other things which were said, which I think are equally, maybe even more important. But since I engage in this enterprise myself, um, I have often thought that, okay, you cannot explain over this domain, no explanation is possible. If you can't explain sort of over an hour domain, you're not really explaining. So what are you doing? You're illuminating for particular purposes, depending upon your own context and so mm -hmm. forth. So I agree sort of with the self-reflexivity with regard to one's context. On the other hand, there's still sort of how, how are you going to illuminate and what are the conditions of illumination and what kind of thickness or description is, is in fact uh, going to be required. So understanding finitude, I've always been beset sort of you know, by that particular problem. You're going to be synoptic no matter what, but can you do, um, can you do a Christian genealogy sort of in which you've got two or three pages on X, Y, or Z um, where you're only sort of talking sort of about the, about the intellectual properties and coherence with something that came before or incoherence with respect to something that came afterwards. What else do you have to provide in terms of its relationship to practices of prayer and liturgy? What else do you have to provide in terms sort of the mode of life and so forth? But even if you turn sort of to the intellectual side, and, and that already is a foreshortening, what do you need? So I take it sort of that what you've just done sort of is, in order for even illumination to be possible, with explanation not being possible in my particular view. It might sort of be the case that you've got to, a, a person involved in this has to provide far thicker descriptions, which then sort of will be a test of finitude. On the other hand, if you want to say something that's illuminating, by which I mean something that is partially, 
and maybe significantly partially disclosive of the truth. I'm not quite sure that sometimes we can get away with the sketches, which at a certain level so become comical. So one of, one of the things that you find when you're reading Heidegger, for instance, right, who's a genealogist in his own right, is that we find latex, which latex, which might actually sort of just be sort of uh, his own jottings. But the fact, for instance, that Heidegger can hyphenate, you know, between Plato and Descartes, uh, and between Descartes and Hegel, that act of hyphenation should be a worry that even the Christian genealogists hardly do that. They do far more than that. But the specter of your discourse is hyphenation. And surely that can't sort of you know, be disclosive of truth. So I think you said much more than that, but I want to emphasize that. I think that's highly, highly important. Um, can I just say a, a few words to that? Um, thank you. I, I, I agree with, with much of your, what, what you're saying here. And I think the explanation and elimination is very good. And I think, um, so this is the, so this is one of the reasons why, um, I often like your genealogies. I, I, I feel I'm less angry when I read them. <laughs> like they're, they're less frustrating, uh, because, uh, because, uh, you're trying to illuminate and not explain. But they also uh, they also end up with the difficulty, and I'm not this is not a criticism, but it's just showing what the problem we're struggling with is. They end up with something like the difficulty I was asking about last time, like when we when we've identified what sort of process uh, uh, is going to happen after that, right, or in that moment when we identify, right. Whereas I think some of the explanatory uh, explanatory genealogies, uh, so. Uh, say M Milbank's uh, one in theology and social theory is very self-conscious about the polemical setting in the beginning, right? So epistemology is sort of set up, um, and therefore uh, 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 you 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 get from the very first page that this is an attempt to persuade, right? Um, but the story also becomes more a just so story, right? Because because sort of the, the question of justification is put almost at the very beginning. Uh, whereas uh, whereas uh, uh, persuasiveness for you, I think often comes more at the end, right? When we sort of gone through this, right? What do we didn't say? I see Darren is sort of, is, 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 uh, well, I would love, I would love to get a question from the floor yeah. in at this point. Um, so let me, let me read a question. Um, from Otniel Chiss. It has to do with Nietzsche um, and it's directed to Ragnar. So is anything clarified about what genealogies can offer and how they can operate if we situate them within Nietzsche's early account of retrieving the past in his essay on the uses and disadvantages of history for life? Specifically, one of Nietzsche's modes of retrieving the past is the critical mode. Um, which offers a normatively critical appraisal of the past, but only in the service of clearing a new ground for thinking and life. Can then genealogical investigations be the first step of a two-step process of retrieving the past for contemporary concerns? Perhaps here we can ask how genealogical accounts can be situated alongside other forms um, of appropriating the past, such as theologies of retrieval. Yeah, uh, it's it's a good question. I I actually think that um, this is more or less how I, or at least how I use a Foucault as a, as a sort of foil and uh, looking back to Nietzsche through him for understanding some contemporary genealogists. I think they use some of that uh, genealogical force of opening up new possibilities, but that is sort of directed mostly at, at uh, stories of secular modernity. And as a first step, and then a sort of another story, sometimes that's written alongside or after uh, you sort of, yeah, you get another one after, after that. I think uh, sure that can, it can be used in that way. And I think some theological genealogists, genealogists are very self-conscious about while nodding back to Nietzsche, this differentiating sort of the fundamental premises for how gen the genealogy is written. But, <clears throat> My my uh, my question, though, is still um, whether we should. Uh, so, uh, 
my question is, might be why we should uh, sort of let the genealogical be primarily a negative first and then positive on the other hand. I was sort of trying to, to grasping for something that's uh, that sort of uh, puts both the uh, both sort of evaluations at stake at the same time, because I fear that uh, leaving the critical aspect first, you sort of you you you're at risk of circumscribing uh, things within which you are implicated. And I think that what Nietzsche genealogy doesn't do for you is, and that's why more traditionalist uh, or Aristotelian views tradition or whatever what they provide is they allow you to self-identify with the, the past that you're talking about. Right? So they allow you to acknowledge that you, you have some relationship already at the moment you begin to, to write about this, you have some relationship and you're implicated in this uh, at the first hand. So, so, um, so that's why I, I see some deficiencies in sort of the Nietzschean tradition.